All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our interview today. I have a really special treat. Uh, today, we're with Dr. Gregory Sadler, and I'm really excited to talk with Dr. Sadler today about living according to nature. And uh, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about how I discovered uh, Gregory Sadler's ideas behind living according to nature with stoicism. But before that, I have to introduce our guest today. Dr. Greg Sadler, he holds an MA and PhD in philosophy from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, which is right across the river from me in St. Louis. His scholarly publishing to date includes one book, dozens of book chapters, articles, and encyclopedia entries. And his work spans the history of Western philosophy, discussing thinkers from Plato to Derrida. He is a team member of the Modern Stoicism Organization, and since 2016, the editor of Stoicism Today. Greg also puts philosophy into practice through his private practice, Reason IO, which stands for Reason It Out. After completing his training and certification with the American Philosophical Practitioners Association in 2014, he has worked with individuals and organizations and as a philosophical counselor, an executive leadership coach, and as an ethics and organizational consultant. So that's our guest today. And if you don't know me, my name is Bob Simber. I'm a philosopher, entrepreneur, educator, and published po poet and short story writer. I'm the owner of Stoic Coach, which is a personal life coaching platform that uses stoicism as a foundation for seven distinct programs, resilience training, life planning, habit breaking, self-love, interpersonal training, confidence, and journaling. I've been practicing stoicism for about nine years, and I'm a survivor of pa clinical panic disorder and applying that to my life. And I hold an undergraduate degree in philosophy and a master's degree in teaching, as well as a diploma in interdisciplinary ethics. So Dr. Sadler, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Living according to nature. And um, it's interesting because if the audience doesn't know, you actually appeared in an interview uh, in 2020 with Harold Langslet uh, Cavley entitled In Accordance to Nature. And that's actually how I found out about you talking about stoicism and having that ability to live according to nature. So why do you think that the idea of living according to nature is one that is of interest to modern uh, audiences? So there's a lot of facets to that. I think you can say that in ancient philosophy in general, it's not just the Stoics, but you know Aristotelians, Platonists, all sorts of others, there is this conception of nature, however it's gonna be interpreted and living in harmony with it or in accordance with it is, is an ideal. And the Stoics, you could, you could view them as doing that in, a more systematic way. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's a slogan that sounds good. I think it got carried through in part because of that. Our, our idea of nature, as we're going to talk about, has changed quite a bit from, you know, say what ancients thought about the world or the human body or, or any of those sorts of matters. But it hasn't changed so fundamentally that the idea has lost any meaning, but, but it, does, it does require a lot of explanation. And I think it's one of those, those things that um, trips a lot of people up when, mm, when they're yeah. starting to, to go into stoicism. And I think, I think that's probably why Harold asked me about those in particular, because I'd done some workshops and I do talks regularly on, well, what does in accordance with nature mean? And, and I, I, my, my answer is, well, it's complicated, you know, which is not much of an answer. People don't usually like to hear that because then you have to explain all the different complicated ways. And so I think he wanted to draw out some of that. And, and there was another question in there too about, about Nietzsche, which is kind of a good in, you know, Nietzsche criticizes the Stoics for getting nature wrong. And as it turns out, Nietzsche and the Stoics have two very different conceptions of what nature is. So it's sort of like walking into somebody's um, Chinese restaurant and complaining because you can't get a pizza, you know, um, <laughs> it's, two, it's two different kinds of things. And so Nietzsche's criticisms can be useful in some respect, but in a lot of cases, they're, they're really off point. And I think there's a lot of other people who 
talk about stoicism and living in accordance with nature, but they haven't really gone back to the ancient sources to see what the, the Stoics themselves had to say. And they're importing all sorts of contemporary ideas about nature for, you know, great example of this is evolutionary biology and psychology where oh, people yeah. bring in, oh, well, you know, males are like this and females are like this. And you're like, first off, that stuff's super speculative. You know, I wouldn't call that science at this point or dignify it by calling it psychology or biology. Uh, until you've got a lot more, you know, hard data behind it. And, and that, that may happen down the road or may not happen. I suspect that it won't. But second, you're working with a radically different idea of what, what nature means than what the Stoics have. So if you try to just like put them together like Legos, it's not a good fit, you know. So that, that's a long-winded way of saying, once again, it, it is complicated. And, and I think it, it is, it's a, a really important idea to explore. Yeah, yeah. And I remember Massimo Piliucci in his uh, book, How to Be a Stoic, he, he tries to dispel it by saying it's not about, you know, throwing off all your clothes and running into the yeah. woods naked and stuff like that. So, um, so tell me, Dr. Sadler, uh, what did the Stoics mean by the term nature? Uh, and what did living according to nature entail? And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was an evolving idea. Um, when we look at some of the summaries of what the Stoics thought and taught, for example, in Diogenes Laertes, um, Lives of the Philosophers, Book 7, which is all about the Stoics, or in Arius Didymus' um, Epitome of Stoic Ethics, which obviously is all about the Stoics, um, you know, the, the Stoics start out with Zeno, and then they go through a whole bunch of people called Scholarchs, and the Scholarchs are the, you know, the next leaders and, and teachers of the school. And none of them remained just with, okay, you know, the, the master is spoken. We don't have to add anything. We don't need to rethink anything. It was a constantly evolving um, philosophical system. And so Zeno started out with just this, apparently this phrase of living in accordance, you know, or living in harmony. And then they said, well, harmony with what? <laughs> Nature, you know, phusis. And that you know, eventually they, they, they clarified, well, that, that means living in accordance with the way the universe is. So if you want water not to be wet, you're going to be disappointed, you know, mm. or, and this also applies to like human psychology. If you want to um, entertain totally contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time, you're going to have some cognitive dissonance. And if you want to not have cognitive dissonance, you're going to have to get rid of some of these contradictory ideas because you can't have it both ways. So there, there's a lot of, you could say a lot of saying you can't have it both ways with respect to the external world and with respect to um, human psychology. But then there's also this notion of nature as distinctively human nature. And living in accordance with it means developing it more fully. And so Massimo picks up on that, right, in his book, How to Be a Stoic. He, he wants to read living in accordance with nature just as living rationally or living in accordance mm. with the virtues. And I, I think there's, there's something to that approach. I think that leaves some stuff out, but it's, it's on the right track. You know, it's sort of like saying, we're, we're moving in the right direction. We just, we're, we're not exploring as much of what ancient Stoicism had to offer. But there is a distinctive concept of what a, a fully realized human nature looks like. So it would be, you know, not being a jerk, right? <laughs> to, to be very blunt. Uh, and we could use all sorts of other words. That's a reflection of the Stoics thinking we have this, this intrinsically they called it social or, or political nature, meaning a communal nature, right? So we communicate with other people. Uh, we can be jerks to them, but we, we should actually try to live in harmony, not just with, with ourselves, but with, with them. Um, you know, managing um, what, what they call appearances or impressions rationally, that's part of living in accordance with nature. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different components that go into developing yourself into a, a fully realized human being. And the other thing I'll say about that too is it's a cumulative process, right? It's not mm -hmm. like you flip a switch or get a checklist and then knock off a bunch of things on the checklist and now you're fully realized. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of what it involves is like making some progress and then you, know, you can see a little bit further and you can 
understand yourself a little bit better and they're like, oh man, I've got even more work to do on myself than I thought I originally did, right? But you're still making, you're making progress towards that, that human nature. So it's, it's not something that's usually finished, um, but it is something that we progressively understand better and better the more we practice stoicism. Mm. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Sadler, was there anything that you could kind of point out that would say, this is how a stoic would have set his or her routine to live according to nature? Is there anything that is kind of that a stoic would say going throughout the day that would say, you know, oh, I need to make sure I don't do X because that would not be living according to nature to kind of schedule themselves, if that makes any sense? I think, yeah, you could have some things like that it's helpful to like set reminders for yourself if you're working on a particular mm. problem like you know I, I got into stoicism originally because i was was looking for resources for understanding and managing anger because I, I you know i uh, had a lot of problems with that in the past um still have some now um i'll admit and uh you know, that, oop, that became sort of a, an area of my, my work and my, my research. So, you know, when it, let's actually use that as an example. So there, 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 it'd be good to start out the morning the way that Marcus Aurelius does in uh, Meditations 2 at the very beginning saying, you're going to run into a bunch of jerks and they're this kind and that kind and this kind and this kind, and it doesn't do you any good to get angry with them. And if you want to make some progress, you need to do this cognitive reframing where instead of getting ticked off with them for being the way they are, you say, well, they don't know what they're doing and um, I have a choice about how I want to do it. So that would be like a morning routine that you could do, right? And maybe, maybe you need to tune up by lunchtime <laughs> <laughs> or maybe there needs to be, it all kind of depends on who you are, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe there needs to be something that you do at, at five o'clock or, you know, before you go to bed, um, that's, you know, there's a lot of things you could do that way. And then there's the things that you have to do at certain times that you can't plan for in the day when you need stoic doctrines or practices to, to bring out when somebody starts pushing your buttons, you know, you can start saying that, that like, the stoics say have this ready at hand, meaning mm, be yeah. ready to use this sort of thing, not at exactly 6.05 p.m., um, when your, your app goes off or something like that, but when somebody is cutting you off in traffic or, um, you know, saying something that you don't like or taking too long in a line, um, while you're waiting behind them or any, any of those sorts of things, or, or your technology is failing. That's another thing we often get ticked off about. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, routine, yeah, you can have routine and then you could say like, there's, there's fixed routines and then there's flexible routines, right? You got the fixed routines where you do certain things at certain times. And then you've got the flexible ones where you approach recurring situations in similar ways. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And, and uh, it's good to have those at hand. Like you said, like the Stoics, uh, you know, command the practitioners. Uh, one of the interesting yeah. things that I saw, uh, Dr. Sadler, from the interview that you had uh, with Cavley was you mentioned that uh, Lawrence Becker, one of the one of your uh, yeah. contemporaries in, in academia, he he uh, he would rather do away with follow nature than follow nature slogan in 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 general. Do you think that that idea to follow nature should be something that contemporary Stoics should ignore completely? No, and Becker didn't think, he, he said it would be nice if we could get rid of it, but we can't, um, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck with it, <laughs> so for better or for worse. Um, there are some modern Stoics like um, Pyotr uh, Stan Kiewicz, who actually studied under Becker, who um, proposed that we should get rid of the idea altogether. And then there's those like Massimo Pigliucci who say, ah, let's just reformulate it, you know, like I said, um, follow nature can be act rationally or, or act in accordance with the virtues. And then there's people like me 
who say, um, nah, there's more to the concept. We need to hold on to it, but it's tricky. So we need to, we need to do some work in helping people to understand it and unpack it. And then I think there's, you can say there's a fourth class who are like, we have to hold on to every single thing we can possibly do. They're very dogmatic about that. And I don't think that's particularly helpful because some of the things that the ancient Stoics say has to do with um, living in accordance with nature is tied in with, you know, traditional gender roles and, and, you know, down oh, to like yeah, wearing a yeah. beard if you're a guy. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm fortunate I've got a beard, right? So Epictetus would be happy with me, but if I shave it off, am I no longer following my nature? I think that sort of stuff we get rid of, right? So there's, there's almost like there's four positions. There's the, and there's two extreme positions. This idea is totally useless. Let's get rid of it. You know, this idea is absolutely great. And we have to, you know, go back to the ancient Stoics for every single thing. And then there's two moderate positions in the middle that I'd say Massimo represents one. And, and uh, my, my approach is a, a more conservative approach. Ah, I see. Yeah. And it's interesting that you, you, you know, kind of divide it up like that because, you know, talking to people online and in, in some of the communities that are on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, the YouTube comment section, right? You know, there's so many people that disagree with how much we should hold on to with, with those stoic ideas, you know? Yeah. And I think there's a legitimate range of um, divided opinion, right? And, and we should, in fact, hash these things out through to reason dialogue, that would be the stoic way to approach it rather than to say, well, the book has said, you know, or anything like that. Um, I, I think there, that, you know, we, we need to bring in multiple voices to figure out like which things from traditional stoic teaching we're going to hold on to. Yeah, um, yeah, that's and that, beautiful. And that's probably not something we settle at one point, you know, once and for all, like have a stoic council, you know. <laughs> And establish the dogma forever. It's going to be evolving. Um, Definitely. It does take yeah. some, you know, this is a bit of a tangent, but I'll say, and I'd like to get your observation on this. You brought up like forums and YouTube comments and, you know, those can often be a real test of putting stoicism into practice because people say so many boneheaded things and, mm. It's tempting to, to sometimes be like, no, that's totally wrong. Why are you even, you know, commenting there, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to remind yourself of, of many of the things that the, the Stoics teach us about how we should engage in, in discourse with others. Um, I, I don't actually, I, I spend less and less time on those because I find them, um, there's so many like conversations you could easily get bogged down in. Um, but, you know, do we have like a duty to to engage those things. That's kind of an interesting question. So, I mean, what do you think about that? You, you, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm fascinated with that question because there's a part of me that says, you know, you know, reading the classics and really getting into what the doctrines say and how to, you know, talk about it and discuss it with people. But then there's a part of me, the, uh, you know, the, the, the coach, the, the friend type of me, the part of me, that's like, you know, I, what we're really looking for is the application of the ideas. And um, even though people might come to the conversation from all these different backgrounds about, oh, you know, I'm only going to practice the dichotomy of control and that's it. That's really all I know about stoicism. That's a very common thing, you know, Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. that, the, 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 you know, oh, what's in my control and what's not. That's what stoicism is. Some people will say, um, I, I kind of like to err on the side of, you know, wow, there's actually getting traction in, you know, communities that people are maybe not there. They're not using a comprehensive, you know, all the tools that stoicism has to offer necessarily. But even if one person can gain, oh, I know the dichotomy of control and it lessens yeah. my anger or my anxiety. To me, I think that that's a small victory, um, not necessarily one that, you know, would be a doctrinaire stoic approach, but if I, I just feel like if there's a little progress that a person can make with even the smallest stoic nugget of wisdom, I feel like that there is a, a, vic, a small victory in there. Yeah, that, that's true. The, the, the trick is to keep the, it's almost like, you know, going to the gym, right? And if you only learn how to bench, you are actually exercising quite a few muscles in your body. In fact, not just your, your chest and arms, but also to a certain extent, your legs. But if that's all you do, 
you're going to come out of things looking pretty weird, you know, <laughs> and your body's not going to be particularly <laughs> well equipped to do much of anything. So you have to have all these other exercises that are complementary in some respects. And some of them do totally different things. And maybe you need to do different things on different days. You know, uh, you, you don't do every single exercise, every single time that you go in. Right. Uh, and and it, maybe you could look at stoicism in that way. Um, the dichotomy of control is definitely important. It's kind of interesting that it only explicitly gets formulated very, very late in stoicism. Mm, oh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's like little hints about it in, in um, Cicero's summaries of the Stoics in Seneca, you know, distinguishing uh, things like what we what we do have control over what we don't but but you know making it front and center that's that's an Epictetus thing yeah so um, so it, clearly it's it's important but it's not the one single thing but I think you are right though that that if there's any one doctrine that somebody is most likely to reduce stoicism to in today's um, present it's that one you know, yeah. it's not, it's not going to be treating the indifference differently or virtue <laughs> is the only good, or, I mean, those are important too, you know, but they're probably, those are not going to get as much traction as the dichotomy of control. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great insight. And yeah, thanks for bringing that up to discuss. It's, it's fascinating. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited, I'm really excited to ask you this question, uh, Dr. Sadler, is when talking about nature and God in the interview, that we, the the, uh, the Cavley interview, you said, and I'm quoting this, you said, what makes human beings special as rational beings is that we carry around us a certain portion of the divinity. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the classic Stoic position. On, on yeah, that. the cl- yeah the cl- and I'm really excited to kind of pick your brain on that. What do you what do you mean by that? And I guess what do you mean by what the the interpretation of the classic Stoics? What do you what do you mean by divinity? Oh God, you know the divine, whatever is higher than us. The Stoics thought of um, I mean they you could talk about like capital G God with the Stoics and then like little G God, and the place to go for this would be like. Um, uh, Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods, book two, which, which provides sort of an overview of the Stoic theology. Um, and then Epictetus, I, I, you know, I took that phrase basically from Epictetus, who says exactly that you're carrying around a piece of God within you. And he also follows that up by saying, so when you go to the whorehouse and you're copulating with prostitutes, you're mixing God in with that. So maybe you shouldn't go there. <laughs> you know? Maybe, maybe this should like make you a little bit better in your behavior, thinking that you're carrying around this, this bit, but you know, what it means is the, uh, the rational part of ourselves, the rational, um, the, the capacity to, you know, think things through and we're not godlike in our, our rationality, right? So we're not perfect, but we we're different than the other animals. And it's something that we have to, um, develop, um, you know, we have to choose to work on it. Um, and so, you know, the Stoics thought that that was, um, what united us with, uh, the divine. They actually talk about us living in a community or commonwealth of human beings and, and the gods and, you know, what they, what they were calling gods with like a lowercase g would be what, um, you know, traditional monotheists think of as angels. Um, you know, they have a part in making the world work the mm-hmm. way that it does They're, you know, they're. They're kind of doing stuff um, behind the scenes. Now, you know, for contemporary Stoics, we don't ne- we don't have to buy into all of that. We don't have to believe in it, but we still do want to recognize some, you know, some distinction between us and the other animals. It may be a permeable distinction. You know, I, I don't know that we have this absolute radical break that the ancients thought between non-rational animals and then us as rational animals, maybe there's, you know, maybe the, the great apes and the whales and dolphins and um, elephants and some other animals, you know, are, are close to that. Uh, octopi maybe too as well. Um, but they haven't developed, you know, technology like we have. They haven't developed, you know, political organization. They if they are rational, they're, they're rational in the way that like underdeveloped kids are. Um, which means that maybe we have to, you know, be careful how we welcome them in. But that also means that perhaps they have a, a spark of the divine in them as well. 
if, if we think of rationality as what we would have in common with, with uh, whatever concept of God we have. I mean, and, and this is, you know, this is only one way in which human beings have thought about what we as human beings would have in common with whatever is above us. Other people have placed it in um, the will, you know, having, having the capacity to choose mm -hmm. or, um, as a matter of fact, Clement of Alexandria says that it's uh, music that we have in common with God, believe it or not. Um, so there's a lot of different options. The Stoics thought it was rationality. Mm. And that means, you know, in a certain way, the more rational we become, the more, the more like whatever the transcendent is, uh, we become, you know. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank, thanks yeah. for that. Um, I'm going to bring up Massimo Piliucci again. I feel like he's coming up a lot in this interview, but uh, he, uh, in How to Be a Stoic, he makes the observation that the Stoics thought that the more that we mature psychologically, as well as intellectually, the more the balance should shift away from our instincts and toward the deployment mm. of empirically informed reasoning. Yeah. And then he, yeah. And then he connects uh, that point to the fact that humans are generally taught to associate with others in order to help them. And that kind of goes along with what you were saying about, uh, you know, stoic, you know, living in an, a more communal fashion. Uh, do you think that this connects to that idea of stoic cosmopolitanism? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, to be a cosmopolitan in some respect means overcoming the, the herd instinct that leads us to identify just with people that are like us, you know, see, um, yeah. and this is something that you see, you know, Cicero talking about it at considerable length, um, Seneca, Epictetus, you know, this, this is something that was really central to, to stoic ideas and i would say um you know any any modern stoicism if it doesn't have that it's not really stoicism it's just like cherry picking stoic stuff to like do your own agenda so any any of the uses of stoicism that we actually call broicism not not stoicism you know where they they stress masculinity and you know um this, this sort of like defend the West sort of stuff, that's not real stoicism because once you take the cosmopolitan stuff out of it, it's, it's so deeply rooted in it that all you're left with is, is really the name and a few sound bites, um, maybe a couple of pictures or something, you know, bus that you can use. Um, yeah, this, this, is, this is something really central and, and it takes a lot of work to do. I mean, we know that it's, um, there's a lot of tendencies within us that make us want to just think about the people that matter to us, to not extend these circles outward to the, to the rest of the world. Um, so that can be a real challenge. <laughs> but I think Massimo was completely right about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and this, this is kind of going back to what you were talking about with technology and sometimes the frustrations that occur with you know, technological discourse on yeah. Facebook, on Instagram. Um, modern life has given us some new challenges, right? When trying to live in accordance with nature. I mean, this is something that's totally, yeah. you know, up the, up the chain of the timeline, so to speak, to, to contemporary times. Um, how would you, Dr. Sadler, how would you address some of the new hurdles associated with technology and they could and how they could interfere with a stoic's attempt to do so um and then apart apart from technology do you see anything else that we need to address to help improve our ability to strive to live in accordance with nature okay yeah those are those are some good questions um i would say that you know what the internet and mobile technology has done that creates new challenges for us um, fall into a couple different classes. One is we're flooded constantly with information if we open ourselves up to it. And there's a tendency to like, you know, get on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, even, even if we're just like going to a news site, you know, there's all these stories there and we have to sort of, you know, pick and choose or they're gonna be picked and chosen for us. Um, what we want to focus on, 
and that, and and realizing that that is a choice that we don't have to just be responding and reacting all the time, but we we should exercise some um, some self rule, you know, using our our uh, rational faculty to to decide what we're going to focus on and how much we're going to consume. So that that's that's one big challenge. Another big challenge is the fact that we, by going onto any platform, expose ourselves to people that we, we don't know and, and we're connected to very anonymously. I mean, you mentioned like YouTube comments. Um, I, I have pretty good YouTube comments because if somebody's a jerk on my, my YouTube stuff, I block them and remove their comment. And so it's sort of like pruning constantly, but you go onto other people's YouTube channels and it's just a cesspool. You know, um, you say something and you're going to have like 10 people saying what a jerk you are and they're not going to use nice words like jerk. You know, <laughs> it's going to be all sorts of stuff like that. And, you know, until we're sages, we probably should try to minimize some of our, our exposure to that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that technology does, especially mobile technology, is it, it, it creates situations in which it's very easy to generate new habits habits that are often not good for us, like checking your whatever app or email 50 times a day, you know, or whenever you're bored or stuff like that. I, I've actually had to, I do a lot of my reading and thinking sometimes when I, when I take a bath and I've had to um, deliberately take my phone, which otherwise I might check Twitter on or check, you know, whether there's new YouTube comments and put it in another room. Uh, and at first I, I, I found that difficult because I'd be like, well, I don't know what time it is. I don't know how long I've spent in here. I need to get to other work. But if I actually want to read something while I'm doing that, it's better to put the phone in another room because it's, it's too easy to get in the habit of constantly interfacing with it, right? And so, you know, um, if you think about these, these three challenges in terms of living in accordance with nature, our nature is not to be... Um, checking app junkies, you know, mm. or to be um, constantly processing this much information indiscriminately, or to be allowing ourselves to get drawn into all sorts of non-productive conversations with total strangers. That's none of that is actually furthering our nature. It's actually making it moving us further away from where we ought to be. So those are some, I mean, there's a lot of other challenges, you know, you think about targeted advertising. <laughs> so that's a, we could actually like have a whole conversation about how algorithms are set up to make things more difficult for us if we are thinking in terms of stoicism. Um, and in some cases we probably have to do a lot of like turning things off and, or, you know, restricting the amount of time that we spend on them or uh, only using them in certain ways. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, then there's, there's the same old challenges that human beings have faced throughout eternity, right? Um, dealing with neighbors who are, are too noisy or don't like you being noisy or, um, you know, make food that you can't stand, uh, the smell of, or maybe they're complaining about your food or pick, pick whatever you want, right? All, all those things are around in ancient times and they continue through to the present. Marcus, uh, talks about a guy whose breath and armpits stink, you know, and are getting angry with him. <laughs> we have an entire industry catered to trying to prevent that, but it, but it still doesn't, doesn't necessarily work. So there's all these, all these challenges. We've got like new challenges from technology and then we've got like the same old challenges that have been around for a long time. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Uh, Dr. Sadler kind of wrapping it up to close. Uh, I'm being, I'm being really spontaneous right now with this next sure. question. Um, if there was one thing or maybe a couple things that we are not talking about in the stoic community right now, Ooh. if there's like one or two issues that we are not addressing, whether it has to do with living according to nature, whether it has to do with something else, is there one thing that we really need to focus on that we're not addressing right now? That's actually a really good question. Um, I know I'm putting you I on get, the spot. <laughs> well, I guess, I, you know, it, it, it's a tricky one because I think there's places where people are talking about it, but it's maybe not necessarily like spread throughout the entire modern stoic community, which is pretty um, diverse and, you know, um, 
people are focusing on different stuff. Um, I, I guess one thing that I, I would bring forward is environmentalism and people oh, are talking yeah. about it, but maybe not enough people are talking about it. So um, Kai Whiting and uh, his, his uh, friend and collaborator, Leo Constanikos, um, they do a lot of stuff on that. Christopher Gill, one of the, you know, key figures in, in uh, the modern Stoic movement from the, the early beginnings of it. Um, he's talked about it quite a bit. And there's others who, who bring it up. And it's one of those things where if there's no environment or if the environment gets degraded too much, all, all bets are off. You can't practice stoicism if you're dead, you know, or if there's no world oh, to work true, in, yeah. right? And we, you know, the, the ancient Stoics did not think of any more than other ancient philosophers of a world that we could, through our own use and misuse of technology, damage irreparably. They sort of took the world uh, for granted that, well, it's always going to be there. Maybe humans will die out, um, but, you know, the world is, is, is going to be there. And we as a species have gotten to the point where we really can um, damage an awful lot of it. I mean, we, and we do it a lot through our, our, our um, use of commercial products and our production mm -hmm. Uh, processes and distribution and stuff like that. So I think um, modern stoicism probably needs to focus more and more on that. But there are people who are, you know, developing that. And, I, and I'm, I'm willing to say too, I'm not, I'm not one of them. I don't do an awful lot of work on that. But I do identify it as a, a really important place for us to be spending more time. All right. All right. Maybe I'll have to get Kai Whiting on because I know he just came out with a new book that I need to get my hands on. So maybe we can get him in here. It's a good one, too. Oh, uh, nice. I just finished right. reading it. Oh, yeah. great. Well, there you have it, folks. This is Dr. Greg Sadler, and we're here talking about how to live according to nature. And Greg, thanks for being on. And I hope you have a lovely, lovely weekend. Thanks. I hope you do as well. All right. Yeah. Guys, if you, I'm posting right now on the, on the slides right now, all of our social media handles, and I will definitely post that below the YouTube video in the channel and hope you guys have a nice weekend as well. And we'll see you next time.